thank you guys for joining me this afternoon. My name is Hannah Holland and I am the Education Manager at the CARE Center. The CARE Center is a child advocacy center in Oklahoma County and we provide services to kids who are victims of abuse. So we actually have two different departments. One department is our Victim Services Department and the other department is our Education Department. So I want to tell you just a little bit about the Victim Services Department. So when kids have been abused or there's an allegation that a child has been abused, um, law enforcement or DHS can make a referral to the care center and those children can then be brought to the care center to receive a forensic interview. And the forensic interview is meant for the child to be able to sit down face to face with just one person and to be able to tell their story. It really helps reduce the traumatization of the child because they don't have to go to the police station and tell the police officer what happened and then maybe go to the hospital and talk to the doctor and say what happened. Um, it just cuts down on everything. So the child advocacy model is basically the, what we do is we want the kids to be able to come to the care center to receive all of their services. So they get to have their forensic interview with us. They have child advocacy if they need it. We provide mental health counseling for as short or as long as they need it, and it's free. And we also provide medical exams on, on our campus as well. So the kids do not have to go to the hospital. So everything is done in one place. And when the kids come to us, they get to play for a little bit and get acclimated <coughs> excuse me, to the environment um, before they go and meet with a forensic interviewer. That way they feel comfortable, and then they feel like they can really just share their story. So the other side is the education department, and that's the department that I manage. And we have two programs. One is what you're participating in today, which is recognizing and reporting child abuse. And the other one is called ROAR, R-O-A-R, and it's an acronym, and it teaches kids about body safety. So towards the end of the presentation, I'll give you a little bit more information about the child curriculum because it's really been beneficial. Um, we've been into We've been able to probably train, I would say, over 5,500 kids in the last year. Um, and so we go into the schools, we go to daycares, we go to foster care agencies, and we provide them with training on how to keep themselves safe from abuse. So I will go into that a little bit later. But I wanted to start out by sharing a video with you. Uh, the video is a story about a young girl named Haley. She was eight years old when she first came to the care center. Um, unfortunately, she was sexually abused by her paternal grandfather, and the abuse started at age six for her, and it took her two years to disclose the abuse. Um, but once she did disclose the abuse, then she was able to come to the care center, and she received her forensic interview, and she went through counseling. And a couple years ago, she came to us and to our CEO, and she said that she really wanted to share her story with others because she wanted to kind of be an advocate and she wanted to let others know that um, she's a survivor and that you don't have to just be a victim. So I'm going to share the video with you, and Haley in the video is now a high schooler, so you'll get to see kind of what it's like, um, what her story is, and you'll also get to see what it's like if you were to come to the care center. I'm Haley, and whenever I was younger, I was abused by a family member I trusted and I thought it was my fault. After a couple years, I decided to tell my parents about the abuse and they knew I wasn't lying because they knew an eight-year-old couldn't make up something that graphic. I can't even imagine having to utter those words to even a mother about what had happened to her. Soon after the abuse happened, I wrote a note and I said that I was sorry for telling on him and that I didn't want him to be mad at me. Her daddy and I, we didn't know what to do. We had no idea. We looked at each other and said, what now? Luckily, a neighbor suggested that we call the care center. When they walk through the doors of the care center, everything stops because the focus is on that child. 
I remember the playground and walking in and it being really kid friendly and talking about what happened on the swings. We start with play therapy and we have a therapy dog named Harlow. We have a team of professionals that are forensic interviewers that sit down with the child, build rapport, help them be comfortable so the child can tell what happened to them and that forensic interview process is audio and video recorded for the purposes of prosecuting their offender. The next stage of what happens is very much individualized to the child and their family. They could need clothing or food resources and counseling is provided for as short or as long as they need it. Haley is an amazing young lady. She reached out and communicated to us that she was ready to tell her classmates what had happened to her. I'm hoping that me speaking today will influence somebody to tell their story if they haven't. Hey, good morning. Hey. I'm proud of you, what you're doing. Love you. Miss Price, I love you too, baby. Bye, Mom. See you later. My abuse does not define who I am. That's what the care center taught me. It told me that I wasn't alone and that I was brave for speaking up and telling my story. My goal today is to tell everybody that is afraid or ashamed to tell their story, that it's okay to talk about it, and that to know that it's 100% not your fault. The moment I stepped in the care center, I knew felt safe and loved because I was still treated like I was a kid and not a victim of a crime. I'm not proud of what happened, but I'm proud that it's okay because I'm proud of what happened. It was such a privilege to see Haley at her assembly talking to all of her peers. She decided to stand up and to be brave. She was brave for every single one of us. So that's Haley's story, and hopefully it kind of gave you an idea of what it's like when you do come to the care center and kind of what the services look like. Um, I will refer back to her story throughout the presentation. Um, but the startling statistic you guys probably saw there at the beginning of the video is that one in three girls and one in five boys will be victims of abuse before their 18th birthday. So just to kind of put this into perspective, um, I want to share a few other childhood um, diseases or issues that kids have, and that is that one in 10 kids have ADHD, one in 67 kids are somewhere on the autism spectrum, and one in 268 kids suffer from childhood cancer. So you can only imagine the prevalence if one in three girls and one in five boys are victims of abuse before they turn 18. This statistic is why we are um, providing you with this training because we want you guys to feel empowered to be able to recognize signs and symptoms of abuse and to be able to prevent it and or intervene. It's also estimated that only one out of 10 kids actually come forward about their abuse. So um, that means there's nine out of 10 kids that are silently suffering and still enduring abuse. They're not coming forward. Um, or maybe the abuse is no longer happening, but they're, they're not talking about the abuse. So um, it's really important for us to be able, again, to recognize the signs and the symptoms so that we can do what we can to help those children heal. So oftentimes, kids will not want to disclose their abuse. Um, and like I said, one out of 10 do, but the other nine out of 10 do not. And this is kind of a list of why kids don't disclose their abuse. Um, a lot of times their abuser or the perpetrator makes the child feel like it's their fault. Um, they're very manipulative. They threaten the child. They will often threaten the child's family or their pets. Um, sometimes kids think that the, the abuse is their fault. So the perpetrator has told them, 
it's your fault. If you wouldn't have acted in this way, then I wouldn't have done this to you or you caused it. Um, and then another thing is, is sometimes kids don't realize that the abuse itself is wrong. And so I kind of have a story, um, a personal story that follows that. I, when I was in high school, I used to babysit for a little girl and she had some speech delays. She seemed a little bit, probably had some developmental delays, but I wasn't aware of them. But she was very uh, touchy feely. She didn't really know a lot about boundaries. Um, and her speech delay was really, uh, profound. Um, and so as I graduated high school, I still kind of kept in touch with her. But this little girl was in third grade and she disclosed to her best friend about things that her and her dad did together. And her best friend at school told her, these are these are different things that, you know, I don't do these things with my dad. I don't think this is right. That doesn't sound right. And so that little girl went home and told her mom about what her friend had shared with her. The mom made a report to DHS and an investigation was opened and then it had come forward that the father had been sexually abusing this little girl since she was about two up until third grade. So this is a perfect example of a child not knowing that it's wrong. So she had been in that environment for so long, um, she just didn't know that it was wrong. So there's lots of different reasons why kids don't come forward and disclose their abuse. Whenever I was a young child, my parents would always teach me about strangers, and they would talk to me about stranger danger, and that was so important. Uh, if I was at the park, they would tell me, you know, don't go with someone you don't know. If they're offering you candy or if they say, hey, come to my van, I have some really cute puppies, you should come look at them, don't go with them. And I think that's a really good lesson for kids to learn, but the sad truth is, is that 90% of the time, kids are abused by someone that they know and that they love and that they trust. So only 10% of the time are kids being abused by a stranger. It's also important to know that abuse really knows no bounds and that it happens in every race, religion, socioeconomic status. It happens in our neighborhoods, our communities, our schools, our places of worship. So um, being aware of this, I think, is really important. So the first type of abuse we're going to discuss is physical abuse. This is non-accidental physical injury to a child. And you can you can see there some of the examples are kicking a child, um, cutting a child, biting, burning, hitting, hitting a child with an inappropriate object. Um, in the state of Oklahoma, it is legal to spank your child. However, it crosses the line into physical abuse if that um, spanking turns leaves a marker or a bruise on the child. So um, yes, it is legal to spank your children, but if you're leaving a marker or a bruise, then it crosses the line into physical abuse. Oftentimes, kids who are physically abused, they will have marks and bruises on the fleshier parts of their body, so typically their abdomen and their buttocks and their thighs. Um, however, sometimes those are areas that are usually covered by clothing and it's hard to see. So what you guys can do is look for marks and bruises that are consistent on their faces, on the backs of their hands, maybe on their neck, their ears, places like that. Kids who have been physically abused often complain about pain. So they might have severe stomach issues or headaches, and there's really not an obvious sign of injury. That could be a sign of physical abuse. Um, anytime they have a fear or maybe they seem scared around their caregivers or their parents, that could maybe be a sign that something's going on. Kids who are physically abused are often very hypervigilant. They're very on guard and very alert. They're constantly worrying about their environment and ways that they can stay safe. So this often um, plays into children's ability to learn while they're in school. So if they're trying to sit still at their desk and listen to their teacher, but they're also really worried about being safe, um, sometimes they're not able to retain as much information as some of the other kids. Also, kids shy away from touch. They startle easily if they've been physically abused. And then they also exhibit aggressive behaviors. So these are kids who may be aggressive towards themselves, maybe towards their classmates, towards teachers, um, even to their parents. So um, sometimes this could be a learned behavior because that's kind of the environment that they've been raised in, or it could also be a coping mechanism because they don't know how to appropriately deal with being physically abused, and so they act out with aggression. The next type is neglect. That's failure to provide a child their basic needs. 
but it goes into a little bit more than just not being able to provide a child with clothing and shelter and food. It could also be leaving a child alone for a long period of time unsupervised. Um, it could be the seven-year-old daughter having to stay home with maybe an infant or a toddler and having to care for that child overnight while the parent's working or out doing something. Um, not providing a child medical attention. So that could be severe medical needs. So maybe there's an open cut that needs stitches and they're not taking the child to get that taken care of. Or it even could be uh, severe dental hygiene issues or a need for glasses. And it's gone un unmet for a long amount of time. Um, and then, of course, abandoning your child for long periods of time. I always want to influence people and encourage them to think about the difference between neglect and poverty because they often mirror each other and it's very difficult to, to really distinguish the difference between the two. And oftentimes we feel that we shouldn't make a report or a referral on a family who maybe is just impoverished and they're not able to meet their child's basic needs. However, if a child is just impoverished and that's all that's happening and their basic needs aren't being met, they're still technically being neglected. So we still encourage you to make a referral to DHS and DHS will most likely just provide that family with resources. They're not going to come out and remove the child from the home just because the child needs resources for glasses or to be able to get Medicaid so that they can get dental hygiene issues taken care of. Some signs of neglect, um, obviously if a child is malnourished or they have inadequate nu nutrition, that could be a major sign of neglect. Um, kids who have been neglected, they often are extremely fatigued. So these are kids who fall asleep in strange places, not just in the classroom if they're tired or, or maybe bored or you know not really paying attention, but it could even be when they're in PE class and there's lots of activity going on, they're still very tired. Um, often kids who have been neglected, they have developmental delays, they're extremely lonely and they have a high need for affection. So then they often have a hard time with boundaries. They may want to be in your space. They may want to hug you and kiss on you and be really affectionate. Um, and they just don't really understand boundaries. Kids who have been neglected and had issues with food where food was withheld from them for a long period of time will often have issues with food and hoarding. So sometimes kids will be up in the middle of the night getting into cabinets um, or in the refrigerator, you might find wrappers or boxes of food hidden in their rooms, under the bed, under the mattress. Um, sometimes I've heard stories about kids at school taking lunches from other kids or trying to take food home with them, or maybe even just eating their food really fast and not really taking time to digest their food. And then the last one is they have impulsive behavior. So unfortunately, children who have been neglected, their chemical makeup of their brain has been altered and they are very impulsive. So they're not able to think before they act. They're very reactive. Um, they are able to sometimes at the end, you know, have empathy and, and say, I'm sorry and understand why their behavior was not the best. But in the moment, they're very impulsive. So the next type of abuse is emotional abuse. This is injury to a child's psychological growth. Um, typically, emotional abuse is paired with another type of abuse. So it's not very often that you will see a child that was just emotionally abused. Um, it can happen, but typically it's paired with another form of abuse, such as neglect or physical or sexual abuse. Um, examples of emotional abuse are verbal abuse, rejection, overly criticizing a child, Isolating a child, so maybe keeping them in a closet or an attic or a basement or not allowing them to have social interaction or going to school or interacting with peers their age. Um, and then exposure to any kind of family violence is also an example of emotional abuse. Children who have been emotionally abused often will develop habit disorders. And what that could look like is maybe a child who rocks back and forth a lot to kind of self-soothe. Um, often they may bite the skin around their nails. They may suck on their shirt collars or their sleeves. Um, this is just kind of their way of coping with what they've been through. These children often are developmentally delayed. And as you can imagine, they have low self-esteem. and so. 
they sometimes develop antisocial behaviors and they have a hard time building relationships and maintaining those relationships. And so it can be really hard for kids who have been emotionally abused to have those um, healthy relationships with peers at school, with their teachers, um, even with parents or caregivers that maybe are, um, you know, taking care of them the way that they should. So. Uh, kids who have been emotionally abused often have attachment issues, so they may overly attach to a caregiver or they may not attach at all, and they often have extreme behaviors. So these kids who have been emotionally abused may be the kids who are throwing chairs or punching holes in the wall or knocking things off the desk or the table when they're upset. The last type that we're going to talk about is sexual abuse, and this is any sexual activity or propositioning between an adult and a child. Um, I always like to make a point to say that this sexual abuse doesn't have to be physical contact. It can just be an indecent proposal, and it can also be exposure. So you can see there in the examples, exposure to pornography, exposure to genitalia, um, an indecent proposal made, uh, rape, sodomy, incest, Prostitution, these are all examples of sexual abuse. Uh, prostitution, I always like to point out as well that um, these are children who are actually being prostituted out um, by an adult. So this is also considered sex trafficking, which is something that happens in our community and in our state right now. And so it's really important for us to be able to recognize kind of what that would look like. Some of the obvious signs of sexual abuse would be if a young girl were to be pregnant or if you notice that um, a child um, has an STD that maybe wasn't born with that STD. Um, anytime a child is excessively seductive, maybe has um, a premature understanding of sex or has inappropriate sex play or tries to engage other kids in sex play, that could be a concern that maybe they've been sexually abused. In the video, I'm not sure if you guys caught it, but Haley, she talked about um, disclosing to her parents about her abuse, and she said her parents knew that she wasn't lying because they knew an eight-year-old could not make up the graphic things that she was saying. And so at eight years old, Haley had a premature understanding of sex. Um, another thing is that kids who have been sexually abused often have a major change in their normal mood and behavior. So. Um, they may be a kiddo who is doing really well in school and has friends and is engaged in extracurricular activities, seems pretty happy most of the time, and then all of a sudden it's kind of a 180, so they're not engaging in extracurricular activities, they don't want to spend time with their friends, they're having a hard time in school, they're having a hard time focusing. Um, or it could also be the opposite. It could be a child who's been very quiet, maybe who's very introverted, and now they're kind of being loud and disruptive, and they are kind of crying out for attention, but maybe not in the best way possible. Um, often, too, kids will have changes in their body image or their self-care. Um, we see this a lot with teenage girls or preteens um, who maybe, you know, bathe on a regular basis. Um, but if they've been sexually abused, they stop bathing and they stop kind of caring about their hygiene. Maybe they change their hair color or they're wearing darker clothing. Um, but they do this because they want to be less attractive to their perpetrators. So they don't care if they smell bad. They don't care if they don't look pretty. Um, they're doing what they can to sort of keep themselves safe from their abuser. This is just an additional list of sexual abuse. So again, if a child is trying to engage another child in sex play, that could be a concern that they've been sexually abused. Um, I like to talk about the fact that kids developmentally are curious about their bodies. This starts out at a very early age, even young babies, little boys, when you change their diapers, sometimes they discover they have a penis and they want to touch it and play with it. And parents typically move their hand out of the way, continue changing their diaper, and kind of go on with the rest of, you know, getting them dressed and things like that. Um, sometimes, though, kids who have been sexually abused, they're preoccupied with exploring their bodies. And you ask them to stop and you talk with them about, you know, when it's appropriate to do those things and when it's not, and they're not stopping it. So that would be a sign that maybe they've been sexually abused. This is just another long list of possible effects of abuse. I think I would like to point out that guilt and shame 
fear and anxiety and anger and hostility, all of those are um, effects and emotions that often stick with kids for a long time before they're really able to kind of heal and let those things go. Haley, in the video, she had a lot of guilt and shame. Um, she was writing letters to her grandfather while he was in prison saying, I'm sorry that I told on you. I didn't want you to be mad at me. I hope you're not mad at me. Um, so she, she held on to that for quite a long time. Um, often kids who have been abused, they have issues with school-related problems. So um, they have learning difficulties. They have a hard time following directions. They have a hard time um, behaving the way they're supposed to with their peers and their classmates. Sometimes kids who have been severely abused, they'll develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So that comes with a whole other gamut of symptoms. Um, but you guys can kind of see the list there of all the other long-term effects. This is just kind of a copy of the ACE study. So the ACE study is really important to me. Um, as an adult, you can take this survey, the Adverse Childhood Experience Survey, and there's a lot of questions on here that ask about your childhood. And if you answer yes to a lot of these questions, the more you answer yes, the higher your risk goes up for all of these things. So if we can intervene now, if we can prevent child abuse and we can educate and intervene now, we can reduce a lot of these things um, for adults because basically looking at the slide, children who have been abused are going to turn into adults who are maybe suicidal, who have mental health disorders, who have substance abuse disorders, who have multiple uh, sexual partners, and that puts them at risk for having um, STDs. Um, it also takes a lot of years off of their life. So their life expectancy is a lot shorter than maybe someone who wasn't abused as a child. There are a few risk factors um, that could put a child at a higher risk for being abused. And so a child who's disabled is almost four times more likely to be abused than a non-disabled child. Anytime there is mental health or substance abuse issues within the family, or if there's domestic violence or um, life crises or high stressors related to poverty, things like that, that could put a child at risk for being abused. Um, and then also poor communication. So if only one out of ten kids actually come forward about their abuse, if a child is in a family unit and there's really poor communication and they feel like they can't reach out to their family members or someone that they trust, um, because that line of communication just really isn't open, then that can put a child at risk for being abused or to continue to be abused, where they are enduring it for such a long time before they ever come forward, if they ever come forward. So how can I tell who an abuser might be? Um, you can't. So abusers um, have this way of sort of cloaking themselves in normalcy. Um, they put on a facade, so you really can't tell who an abuser might be. It could be um, an esteemed uh, member of your community. It could be someone in your church. It could be a family member. It could be someone at the school. Um, there are a few things that you can look for that may be red flags, and that would be if maybe someone is being very controlling or manipulative towards a child, um, if that adult is isolating a child from a, a children's group. So if it was a sibling group or maybe a sports group or a classroom full of kids and they're taking that child and they're giving them rewards and special attention and things like that, that might be a red flag. But you can't ever really tell 100% for sure if, that, if they're an abuser or not. Um, it says, what can I do to protect kids from child abuse? You're doing it now. You're participating in this training, and so you're learning the signs and the symptoms of abuse, and you're going to learn um, what to do if you suspect it, which is talk to the child, believe the child, and then report the situation as quickly and appropriately as possible. So um, you just want to be able to call the 1-800 uh, child abuse hotline number. Um, it's on the screen. You guys can always Google it. It's really easy to find, and once you have um, some type of suspicion, then we want you to report it. The primary goal for you, if you suspect abuse, is to find out who did what to the child and where the child was when it happened. Um, and you also want to keep questions very limited. You want kids to be able to come forward and tell their story. Um, you don't want to put words in their mouth. 
you want to ask open-ended questions. So you don't want to ask questions that are, is it this or that, true or false, yes or no. You want it to be more open, like what was that like? Um, tell me more about that. What happened? Those are the types of questions that you do want to ask. If you have a child that discloses to you, this is a list of the things that you should do. We want you to be calm. We want you to let the child know that they're doing the right thing by coming forward and thanking them for telling you. Um, always believe the child. Don't criticize the child. Don't criticize the abuser because 90% of the time the abuser is someone that they know and love and trust and we don't want the child to recant their story. Uh, we also don't want the child to start minimizing what happened by saying things like, well, it only happened one time or he really didn't mean to or she didn't do it that hard. Um, so we just don't want you to ever criticize the abuser. We also don't want you to confront the alleged abuser, too. So if you happen to be able to have contact with the alleged abuser or um, perpetrator, we don't want you to, to do the investigation, to approach that person and say, so-and-so disclosed this to me and I wanted to talk to you about it. We want you to leave that to the professionals. So DHS is the one that can do the investigation. Um, we don't want you to make promises you can't keep and then you don't want to take pictures and you don't want to video or audio record um, any kind of disclosure. This is basically because if this were to go to court, we don't want you to be subpoenaed to court. We don't want you to be considered an expert witness. Um, sometimes when you maybe go to, if a child discloses to you and then you say, wait a second, I want to record this, um, and then you record it, sometimes the child will say something a little bit different and it may be taken out of context. And so if that ends up being in court, Often the defense attorney can have the whole case thrown out because um, of the evidence. So you don't want to take pictures or audio or video recording. Everyone in the state of Oklahoma is reported, I mean, I'm sorry, is required to report um, any kind of suspicion of abuse. So if you report it, if you suspect it, sorry, we want you to report it. Um, anyone who is 18 or older in the state of Oklahoma is required. So it's not just teachers and doctors and therapists. It's anyone who's 18 and older. So you don't want it to be something where um, you could have made a quick phone call to keep a child safe. And if you don't report it and something were to come through, um, it's a crime. So you could actually be um, prosecuted for it as well. So. This is a list of what to do if you want to report child abuse. So you just want to gather as much information as possible about the child. If you're working with a child at the school, typically in the office they have a lot of this demographic information. Um, gather as much as you can as possible. Sometimes the DHS workers ask lots of questions and you may not know some of them, and that's okay. But we want you just to give them as much as you can, and then you're going to call and make the report. When you do make the report, if you give them your name, they can give you a referral number. And if you keep that referral number, you can kind of track the status of the case. So you can't get confidential information by calling back in with that referral number, but you can call back in and say, I made a report um, two weeks ago. This is my referral number, and I feel like nothing's really happened. Can you kind of tell me where you are with this case? And they can let you know if it was ruled out or if they made an investigation or kind of where the case is. Um, if you're wrong, nothing happens. So this is, again, why we strongly encourage you to make reports if you suspect abuse. Um, if you suspect it and you don't report it, you can get in trouble. But if you are, you have a suspicion and you report it and you're wrong, you're not going to get in trouble. Nothing's going to happen. Um, you're going to keep a child safe and you're going to feel better by knowing that you did the right thing. Anytime that you feel like a child is in any kind of immediate danger, um, then you can call the police. Just call 911 because they can respond immediately. They can take the child's statement. They can take pictures. They can audio, video, record, those types of things. Um, and so if you're with a child and you feel like they're going to be in immediate danger, then you can call 911 and then they will contact DHS. You won't have to do that. So does anybody have any questions? I believe you can type in questions and I would be able to see them if anyone had any questions.
you could do that. Is that correct? Correct, and I have not seen anybody respond yet. Okay. So let's see. I can pull up the chat box there. This is a good time to ask any questions. If you'll just type them into your chat box there, we can see the questions. You answered every single question. <laughs> or they're afraid of this topic, so they don't want to say anything. I don't see anything. Okay, well, I have Are one more thing. Oh, I have one more thing to, to tell you guys about, and that was what I was talking about earlier, and that's our kids' curriculum. So the kids' curriculum is ROAR, and it's an acronym. Um, Rex the Lion is our main character. And this, let's see. Yeah, right. Oh, you're fine. I kind of messed up your screen. Yeah, go. There we go. So that is what the acronym stands for. R stands for remember privates are private. O, okay to say no. A, always talk about secrets. And then R, raise your voice and tell someone. So this is a 15 minute long lesson that we teach kids pre K through second grade or ages four to eight. And it basically just teaches them about body safety. Um, we bring Rex the Lion into the classroom or into the group setting that they're in, and it's very interactive. We have coloring sheets, and we have a parent guide so that the parents have something to take home to continue the conversation with their kids. Um, but it's been really impactful. Um, therapists have used it. Sometimes kids will disclose things after they've gone through the lesson. Um, and sometimes kids are just like, okay, I've learned something new. And it's really fun because they get to roar like a lion. So they love that. Um, so again, if anybody wants to have this curriculum in their school or maybe they know an organization that could benefit from it, you guys can send an email to Jennifer and let her know that you're interested because we would love to come out and provide this um, training to the kids because, like I said, we go to schools and daycares and churches um, pretty much any child serving organization. So um, we're really proud of it. And if you guys are interested, we would love to come out and teach it to the kids. So that is it for me. Thank you guys so much for your time. I appreciate it. And maybe see a question. Yes. What about a chronic life problem? Is, is that a reason to call DHS? Is that considered abuse? Yes. So. If a child has a uh, severe lice problem and it's gone untreated for long periods of time, then yes, that could be considered neglect. And so we encourage you to continue to um, make a referral to DHS. Okay. If you guys have any more questions um, while she's here in the next few minutes, we'll be um, kind of touching base with our little chat box to make sure we get them all answered. Um, I'm Jennifer Wilkinson, I'm the Director of Alternative Education, and I'm really excited that you guys um, logged in and um, were with us today. Um, just several announcements that um, our last webinar of this school year will be April 24th, and it will be with the mental health and substance abuse. And we'll be going over risk and protective factors and the OPNA, um, which is the Oklahoma Prevention Needs Assessment that um, districts can give out in middle school and high school. And they'll be talking about those things and the data that you can get from that for your district. And our March um, webinar was um, uh, with DHS about the ACE survey and trauma. And we told you that we were going to be going on the road and doing more um, extensive training, and we have those dates now. We'll be in McAllister on April 17th, in Duncan on April 20th, Bartlesville on April 25th, and Woodward on April 26th. So be looking in the listservs that are coming out from the State Department for those Eventbrite links. Um, if you are interested in a more in-depth um, professional development on the ACE survey and secondary trauma. And the last thing I have is if anybody from the um, Oklahoma Old Dead Association is on and wants to say anything. If not, then we are done and I'm not seeing anybody. Um, how can I sign up for more information? Um, you can email me at jennifer.wilkinson 
at sde.ok.gov, and I'll be able to either connect you with the care center if you're wanting more information on that, or to the various listservs and professional development opportunities, I'll be able to send that out. And so if you go on just the State Department of Ed website and um, type in alternative education, it should take you to um, my contact information as well. Okay, I think we are done. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming.